Good morning, Journey Church. How are y'all doing? Oh, y'all better wake up. 9 a.m. was louder than that. Good morning, Journey Church. How are y'all doing? All right, that first response is why I told the 9 a.m. Christians that they're the most Christian because they came at 9 a.m. But I do want to let y'all know that I give y'all some leeway because if I didn't have to be here at 9, I'd be here at 1030. Amen. For those who don't know, I'm the student ministry pastor here at Journey Church. My name is Javon. I am happily married. Just got married in August. Um, she's not here right now, otherwise I'd prove it. Um, we have two little, wonderful bedrooms in our apartment. Uh, no kids anytime soon, because I'm in youth ministry. <laughs> Everybody's asking, are you nervous? Are you scared to get on the big stage? And I said, have y'all seen y'all kids? <laughs> I love y'all kids, I promise. But there's nothing scarier than teenagers who think they're too cool and 12-year-olds going through puberty, amen? <laughs> I'm also not nervous for one other reason. We're in our How to Neighbor series, and I'm teaching on the poor. And who better to preach on the poor than the youth pastor, Amen. <laughs> All right, let's get started. <laughs> so actually, I actually grew up poor. Um, as most of you guys don't know, but I was born in Georgia. Any Georgia Bulldogs fans? Probably not. Um, that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> but we moved around a lot. You can't expect uh, any Georgia fans out here. But we moved around a lot, right? We weren't a military family um, until I was in high school. And to me, it was normal. Moving around, that's a normal thing. That's not weird. In fact, I believe that when you're a kid, it's really hard to tell the difference between somebody who has money and somebody who doesn't have money. For example, we're all eating mud. <laughs> we're all playing outside. We all pretty much look the same. So it took until I got older to understand the differences between all of us. In fact, it wasn't until I moved from Georgia to Michigan. Um, yeah, Michigan, for one, that I realized that none of this was making sense. Because when we moved from Georgia, it wasn't a, hey guys, we're moving in a couple months, say goodbye to your friends, be excited, you're gonna have a new school. It was, hey guys, we're moving. And I said, when? And they said, today. I said, but I have a girlfriend. My second grade girlfriend's gonna be so mad. <laughs> but every time we moved, there was a really fast process. And I just figured that when you moved, it was a fast process. It wasn't until I moved into a friend's house when I was a sophomore that I realized that it's actually not such an easy process. You're supposed to take it slow. But I moved in with this friend because I got to a point where I was like, there's something wrong. When I was a kid, I just figured, Santa Claus, don't come around to this neighborhood. Or I just figured, the Easter Bunny, just don't bring baskets around here. And then I realized that everybody else had these things, and I said, well, why don't I have these things? I met a good Christian around that year who said, God's going to bring you everything that you need. And I said, well, buddy, I am waiting for that day. In fact, I encountered a lot of Christians growing up who always told me, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Now, I've looked in the Bible um, a few times, and I can't find that verse. Nowhere in here does it say, God is not going to give you more than you can handle. You know, there are so many times growing up that I was trying to understand, how could God love me but allow me to live like this? You all have to realize that poor people aren't these aliens, right? They're still humans. I feel like this is a hot take, but I feel like we started to dehumanize poor people as if they're not human beings. For example, you're driving down the road, you have your windows down, it's a nice sunny day in Phoenix, Arizona, you see a homeless person on the left side of the I-17, and you roll that window up. You don't make eye contact, because you know if you make eye contact, you're going to feel guilty. Or you say, I don't have any cash on me, otherwise I totally would. We always make those excuses. But I was one of those kids. My poverty didn't look like holding a sign on the side of the road because I had way too much pride for that. Big issue growing up. My poverty looked like this. We go out to a restaurant. Everybody orders. 
And all of a sudden, you'll hear me say, no, I'm not really that hungry. I'm going to pass out on this one. Or it looks like this. We go clothes shopping. And my answer is, didn't really find anything that I really liked that much, enough to buy at least. Poverty looks different at different levels, and we have to learn how to neighbor those people. You know, it's a lot easier to neighbor somebody when they're like you. It's way easier. Notice your friend groups, the people that you hang around with. Usually they're a lot like you. Usually the people that you love the most are a lot like you. But then you meet somebody who's really different than you, and all of a sudden it's just a little bit harder. Then you meet somebody with a different social status than you, and then it's a lot harder. Now, before you start slamming your checkbooks closed and say, the church ain't getting my money today, hear me out on this. It's not only financial support that helps you neighbor the poor. Remember that. It is not only finances. I had three families growing up that really changed my perspective on the world. Because when you grow up poor, you end up with this poor perspective. Like Cardinals fans during football season. Um, but this poor perception of what life is going to be like. But I had these three people, these three families that really came alongside of me. Number one was the Reed family. These were people who grew up in the church for the most part, people who were really active in the church that was in my town, people who really cared to see me change the path that I was going on. There's a second family. Conley's, Sarah and Charles, they didn't give me money, but what they did is they gave me access to a studio because I was creating music. They said, hey, you want to come by the studio? I said, yeah, I'd love to, but $300 an hour is not going to happen. I don't have money like that. And they said, no, 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 come on, we'll take care of you. For six years, I recorded in that studio and didn't pay a dollar. And then the third was another church that I didn't even know of until they called my phone and said, hey, we want you to come perform at our church. Now, why this is important. Charles and Sarah gave me access to a studio that allowed me to create music. This music made it on the news. This church heard about this music, asked me to come in and perform it. When I performed it, they took a love offering and they gave me money. That money allowed me to buy a plane ticket. That plane ticket took me to Arizona That's where I went to Grand Canyon University. The second week of school, I meet my wife. Three years later, I'm here. It didn't start with money, though. All it started was with somebody believing in somebody who was not like them. We all love Romans. The book of Romans, you know, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? That reminds us that we're going to have problems and we're probably not going to fix them right. Or when somebody drives a little bit too close to you on the highway and you let out a little bad word and then you say, well, for all of sin and falling short of the glory of God, amen. (laughs) Y'all love Romans 8, 28. I've seen it on every single person that I know's Instagram. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It makes you feel good, doesn't it? That I'm called to a purpose, Amen. Feels good to hear. Well, let's read Romans 12. If you guys have your physical Bibles, pull those out. Romans is New Testament, if you didn't know. In fact, the new Bibles, they have an alphabetical listing in the front, and they'll tell you what page it's on, probably around page 1300. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning, and y'all listen to this. Don't think that you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each, has, each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things. 
Remember this. In his grace, God is giving us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is to serve others, then serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, then take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness, do it gladly. And hear this. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy. High schoolers hate that verse. (laughs) Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them and always eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. And don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think that you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, saith the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Let's pray real quick. Thank you, Lord, for this congregation, God. I pray that everything that we learn today, we can take out of this place, God that we truly believe in you enough to follow your word and not just hear it. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So I said that neighboring the poor is not all about giving money. Let's be honest. We really like our money. Does anybody not like their money? Thought so. But you can also use your gifts. I explain how that one gift spurred an entire domino effect of all these other things. But there's one thing about that gift that made it more than just access. Is that that gift was not given for no reason. It was given intentionally, but it was given intentionally to make an impact. This is what I have to say about that. An impact is greater than an intention. Let me ask you this. Let's say you invited me over to your house and I cook dinner for you. Somehow a napkin catches on fire and it burns down your entire house. And I say, and the insurance company says, yeah, we don't cover that. Are you going to look at me and say, well, you had good intentions? Or are you going to remember more the impact of the fact that your house burned down? An impact is greater than an intention. In a high school small group that we had a couple weeks ago, we talked about our troubles and how people came alongside of us, specifically Christian people. And I have a student who lost her father within the past year, and I asked her, what helped during that time? Because I can't imagine what would help me during that time. And what she said, she said, when people prayed with me, it had an impact on me. When people sent us things that helped us financially or with food, that's what helped me. But you know what didn't help me? All the people who said they're praying for me. Now, I believe in the power of prayer, but I also believe we can't keep using that as a crutch to not help somebody. You cannot keep using prayer as a crutch to not actually do something. Now, believe me, I believe in prayer more than anything. When we left for CIY camp this year, when I first started, two of my students' parents had cancer. We prayed for them all week long. Within a week of getting back, both of those parents recovered. 
I believe in the power of prayer, but I also believe that there has to be some type of help beyond that. This is why. I feel like we're walking around like this. Closed fists. You call this closed fist Christianity. Not like fighting, but like everything I've worked so hard for, I have to hold on to it. We look at homeless people and we're like, I can't give you what I have because I worked hard for this. You didn't do anything. You're just standing on the side of the road with a sign. I worked hard for this. How dare you ask me to give some of this away to you when you've done nothing? We've all felt like that at some point. But I don't know your guys' employment backgrounds or if you've ever managed like the restaurant or a store, but I've managed many, and I've always learned one thing about hiring and firing people. The people who get hired are nicely dressed, clean cut, they have a nice resume. That's who you hire. Now, you cannot tell me that a homeless man is going to walk into a store and get a job. Come on now. We are not that naive. I'm sorry, guys, but we are not. That. There's no way that you can wholeheartedly believe that a homeless man or a kid with really bad clothes and really bad odor who needs the money doesn't have the skill set because he couldn't grow up, he couldn't go to college, he couldn't do any of that. You cannot tell me that that person has a fighting chance even in a minimum wage job. They don't. So what do we do? Let me tell you about the time I talked to a homeless guy. His name was Fish. I don't know why, and I have no intention on finding out why. But I talked to him and I said, hey, can I get you some food? And to my surprise, he said no. And I said, aren't you homeless? Like, isn't that what we do? Like, we give you food? And he said, you know, I would love food. But the thing is, I know that this help won't be here tomorrow, so I don't care for it. Think about this. You have your nice little Jesus fish on the back of your car little sticker that says what church you go to, little verse at the bottom right panel. You're driving past these homeless people every single day and not helping them. What does that say about our God? What does that say about the religion that we believe in? I heard this quote in a movie, and it says, there's a difference between what we work for and what we live for. One has to be greater. And it's our choice. What's going to be greater in your life? What you work for or what you live for? When I was a senior in high school and I felt God calling me to ministry, my first thought was, so I'm going to be poor forever? But what I felt God telling me is that the fulfillment that you're going to get from carrying out my will is going to be so much greater than material possession. And I believe that. But what I'm stuck with thinking is that I don't know if all Christians believe that the fulfillment of doing God's will is much bigger than our material possessions. I really hope you guys do believe that. It's kind of scary to think that there's an entire world that surrounds us that thinks that this is the only place that we're Christians. There's an entire world outside of the walls of our church that thinks that this is the only place that we are Christians. Let's pull out some statistics just real quick. Nearly half the world's population, more than 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. More than 1.3 billion live in extreme poverty, less than $1.25 a day. 
One billion children worldwide are living in poverty. According to UNICEF, 22,000 children die each day due to poverty. 805 million people worldwide do not have enough food to eat. More than 750 million people lack adequate access to water, to clean drinking water, and the effects of that kills an estimated of 842,000 people each year, or 2,300 people a day. And last but not least, the World Food Program says the poor are hungry, their hunger traps them in poverty, and hunger is the number one cause of death, killing more than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip you into caring about the poor, but come on. Let's be honest with ourselves. Should the church have to guilt trip you into caring about the poor? Should they really? Should this even really be a conversation? Now, I understand how it's hard. I understand that you worked so hard for what you have in the thought of it being taken away for somebody that you don't even know. It's scary. But what bothers me is that people believe in me. That's what bothers me. People believe in me now. Six years ago, I'm willing to take the bet that 95% of this room would not have taken the chance on me. Six years ago, I was just like everybody else, thinking the only way to rise up through life is either do something illegal or somehow somebody's going to give something to you. I have friends still back home who sell drugs, friends back home who do a lot of illegal things, rob people's houses, how am I supposed to look at them and say, God's going to help you out? How do I look at them and say that? In all honesty, that's the difference. In Luke 6, 43 through 45, it'll be on the screen, it says, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Fig is never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from a tre treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. My question is, what's in your heart? This is a hot take, but think about this. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody with resources, which you might already be in. And what I don't want you to do is think about if you were in this situation. What I want you to do is think about if somebody that you loved was in the same situation as somebody that's on the side of the street. And ask yourself, if that was my wife, would I allow her to stand on the side of the road? If that was my brother, if that was my son, my daughter, my mother, my grandmother, would I allow them to struggle endlessly? We love mission trips, right? But I think what we love about mission trips is that for a short period of time, we get to see what other people go through, but we forget that in the back of our mind, we always know that we have a place to go afterwards. That that struggling place that you're in is just temporary. But there are people in this world who repeat that cycle every single week. The places that you're cleaning up, they live there. How you're like, I got super sick because the water was bad. They drink that every single day. But this is a real issue. And until we start believing that it's a real issue, it will continue to be one. I'm not saying to write a check, a check big enough to fix everything in the world. That's not plausible. But what I am telling you to do 
is evaluate your resources, evaluate what you have, evaluate your gifts, and find out how you can actually neighbor the poor. I'm going to end on this story. Over this weekend, I've been house-sitting for Carlisle, who's one of our pastors. He's out running the Iron Man and walking it and biking it and swimming it. Don't know why people do that. <laughs> no, I forgot to tell y'all, just real quick. You know, he does that manly stuff, right? He does biking, all that stuff, all that athletic man stuff, you know? Joe hunting right now, you know? CrossFit, intense working out. I don't know why I call it that, but that's probably just all that it is, intense working out. And I just want my props for what I do that's manly. In seventh grade, I ran track. (laughs) Thank you. But let's end on this. Right now, I'm house-sitting for Carlisle. He's got two little dogs. They're cute and stuff for 10 minutes. Um, (laughs) Love these dogs, kind of. And last night, I'm like, I need to sleep. I got to preach on the main stage. I can't have bags under my eyes. That camera's nice, and I don't want it to make me look like I'm crazy, Um, like the hair doesn't already do it. Um, But these dogs, they're barking, scratching at the door. And like, I I don't know dog language. I don't. I don't have a dog. I've never had a dog. So I'm just like, stop, please. (laughs) For two hours, they're scratching at this door, scratching at this door. All they want to do is go outside. I don't know that because I'm not a dog. They're scratching at this door. They're making it known that they want to go. And I'm like, no, I'm way too comfortable in my bed right now. In my bed, I mean, in not my bed because I don't live there. (laughs) But I said, I am not getting out of my comfortable spot in order to let you out. So my question to you guys as we close is, are you willing to help somebody out of their situation, or are you scared because it might make you uncomfortable? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this room, God. Thank you for all the people in this place, God. Raise them up and show them your love, God. Teach us how to emulate your compassion. As we move forward, Lord, don't let us call ourselves Christians if we're not going to live like it, God. Let our hearts be open to those who need us the most. God, whether that's a poor person, an orphan, stranger, a widow, open our hearts, God. We need to learn how to neighbor the people around us better. The church is not only in this place, but it extends outside of those walls, and we can no longer put you in a box. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.